imagine one week thinking you have a million dollars and then the next week suddenly that being worth $250. So there's a significant amount of people who lost a significant amount of money just because you know the trust went away and the value of these tokens completely imploded. Friends, welcome to the Metacast Roundtable by Navic. And today I'm joined by Anton Gorodeski, co founder hey at Invest Game and head of Player One Gaming Media. Been a long time, Anton. Good to see yeah. you again. I've been missing you guys. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, we've been missing you too. Um, Nick, uh, Nico is also here. Nicholas Verrick, one day I'll pronounce it right. GM. Investor at Bitcraft and also co host of the Metacast. You know him from the Crypto Corner. And Aaron Bush, co founder of Navic. So, hey everybody. So a, Navic, a Navic team today. Hey. Um, just before starting to record, I was sharing how I'm doing interval training after this recording and I did calisthenics yesterday, and Nico was very proud. Yes, And I was very proud of Nico I, I for think, being um, so proud because he always hypes everyone up when they do something healthy. And I think we all need that in our lives. <laughs> yes, I am. Um, you know, one of my jobs, not a lot of like, I don't talk about this on the podcast, but I'm also a CrossFit coach. And so um, two weeks, two days a week in the morning, I coach people in CrossFit. And the other days of the week, I, I train myself uh, at 7 a.m. And um I enjoy seeing people work out. I enjoy working out myself, and I've I've seen how how much better it makes people feel in mm -hmm. general. And so I think um, exercise is, is is I haven't heard of anyone saying exercise is bad for you. <laughs> Too much is bad for you, but if as long as you keep it on a on a good level, I think um, it can only do good things. You'd be happy to know, Nico, that I I'm, uh, I'm again doing boxing now. Oh, uh, like for a month or so, and I also walk uh, every day to my office because it's in like it's like a fifteen minute walk uh, from my place to my office. Mm. It's like nice. seven thousand step steps. Um, both. Anton, do you own stepping shoes to do that? Are you making <laughs> no, no, I do not. But I've been uh, <laughs> I've been following the like the latest deconstructs, and I've been uh, I saw your post on LinkedIn about that, and I was like, yeah. Is, so Nico is now criticizing crypto. <laughs> <laughs> the thing, well, yeah, I I do criticize crypto, and and we can go into that. I, I think that's going to be our first topic, but I, I want to take. Uh, you know, Maria's uh, hosting uh, responsibilities away from her, but I, I do criticize crypto and I do even criticize crypto that's about exercising. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm clearly not as, as red pill as I should be or as, as you'd expect me to be. Okay. Aaron, can we also have an exercise corner podcast segment? Yeah, I mean, I think we could all we could all use it. Nico, if you ever move to Dallas, Texas, I'll I'll join your CrossFit classes. I don't know the odds of that are probably like zero point zero zero one percent, but yeah. the offer is there. Yes. Okay. Note it. Note it. Okay, I want to launch this listeners poll. Let us know if you'd like to attend a live stream of Nico doing a CrossFit class, and we all do it together. Wow. With him. Wow. That'd be that'd be interesting. So one day, the, Nico for the, for the three people. Nico's yeah. gonna join Strauss from Take Two in his like live stream exercise sessions. He does that, doesn't he? Oh, really? <laughs> That's oh. awesome. Yeah. I was thinking we'd launch an Nico. NFT that gives special access to the to Nico's exercise <laughs> live streams or something. That's pro that's probably the way to go. It's gonna be expensive. <laughs> yeah, I'm down. <laughs> Me too, I'm down. I, I think this 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 stuff makes sense. Yes. <laughs> anyway, Nico, carry, carry it on. What what bad news did you bring us today? So, um, wait. So we're, we're diving into the topics, yeah, right? Yeah. I'm not. Yeah. That that's your question. Okay. Just just to be clear, um, if if there was other bad news I was going to talk about, <laughs> but anyway, as you might know, so if you have friends that are into crypto gaming, today would be a good day to send them a nice text message, to go give them a hug if you can. Um, support them a little bit because the past weeks have not been easy for most people in the industry. Um, and so, you know, as our first topic today, I, will, I was going to talk about why. So what happened exactly? Um, as many of you know, there is this blockchain. It's not really called Luna, but it's token called Luna that completely imploded. Um, and so the idea was today to quickly discuss from a relatively high level what happened. Um, and some learnings we can take away from what ha from what happened um, and how we can you know 
yeah, how we can make better decisions when it comes to you know crypto platforms and these types of things moving forward. Um, Maria, I'm going to count on you to help me explain stuff that I go over too fast because, um, yeah, some some of these things I don't explain enough. So feel free to just stop me and, and ask for some uh, clarifications. Yeah, yeah, go for it. All right. So what are we talking about? The Terra blockchain has imploded. Um, and with it, the price of the of Luna, which was their um, their coin, and UST, which was their stable coin, um, both of the prices of these assets have collapsed. Two weeks ago, Luna was still at one hundred dollars each, and today I've just checked; it is around one percent of one cent, so it's pretty much gone to zero. Um, and UST, which was supposed to be a stable coin. And which was pegged to the dollar. So in theory, USD, one USD should always be equal to one dollar. Um, it is now worth ten cents. Um, so very quickly, um, stablecoin. The concept of stablecoin is something interesting. I'd like to go into it a bit. The different types of stable stablecoins. Um, and so, why? What is a stablecoin, and why does it exist, and why is it useful in within crypto and within crypto gaming specifically? Also, so a stablecoin is essentially a coin that um, is not as volatile as the rest of the crypto world. So every time. Um, you see an article about Bitcoin in the news, you see some wild fluctuations in the price of Bitcoin and as, an, as a consequence also Ethereum and as a consequence the rest of the crypto market. Um, and this is very annoying for a lot of things that you won't, would want to do with crypto, which is why people have, have invented stable coins. And so a stable coin is a crypto token. Um, that you can move over the blockchain. So, for example, if you have an Ethereum address, um, you know you have Ether as a coin. Um, you have other tokens. These could be game tokens, and then you also have stable coins that you can use as any other token, but that are always stable in price or supposed to be. Um, and so, this is useful with pricing, for example. Um, so, if you are building a blockchain game and you want people to buy an NFT to start playing the game, for example, and you want that to be at a price that reflects how much people would pay in the real world for a game, let's say $50, um, it's very hard to price something at $50 with Ethereum, for example, because the price of Ether can vary wildly. And so one day it could be you know, $100 and the next day it could be $30. And so that's why stable coins are safe or, or use, useful. Um, and another reason why a lot of people use stable coins, it is to diversify and hedge. So a lot of Crypto gaming companies have raised funds through NFT sales. Um, often NFT sales happen in ETH. And again, ETH is very can fluctu uh, fluctuate wildly. But if you as a company have to pay wages, if you have to pay rent on the building that you're using, um, these don't happen in ETH. You have to pay those in, in dollars or euros or whatever. And so for these companies, it's usually they usually take at least like a significant part of what they sold in ETH um, to stable coins. So they're sure they have that money and they can always um, use that to pay the, the bills that are due in, in these specific uh, uh, fiat currencies. Why, so um, you know, why would someone, yes. you know, I understand from a company perspective, from an individual's perspective, why would they hold a stable coin? So um, this is more as a um, hedging strategy. So a lot of people are very exposed in terms of net worth to crypto. So a lot of people have made a lot of money using crypto, right? If you bought ETH at $1 each, which you could about like five years ago, and now it's worth a few thousand, you suddenly have a majority of your net worth in mm -hmm. crypto. And so it's super volatile. Um, and you know, for a lot of people, that this makes it hard to sleep. And so they prefer to sit on, they, they call it like, oh, I'm 50% in stables, they say. And so they is, still have most of their net worth on the blockchain, but the majority of it um, or significant part of it is actually in stable coins, so less volatile. And actually, we can go into deeper why people actually used USD as a stable coin, um, but that's a, a point I'd like to make later. Okay, I, I can foresee then what the bad news are. Um, so... What do you mean? Bad news? I assume bad news are coming. I feel you're preparing us. Oh, and, okay. Well, the thing is, so okay, you have stable coins, and so um, yeah. So quickly about the different types of stable coins, because I also think that this is a very relevant um, discussion or something to know. So very broadly, you have two categories of stable coins. One are collateralized stable coins, and collateralized stable coins are stable coins that have collateral. Um, and so, which means that, for example, um, Tether is a term you might have uh, heard. Um, I'm not sure if the company is called Tether, but it's the USDT. And it, it's, it's, I think, one of the most widely used um, stable coins. And so what they have is they have 
supposedly, and there's a lot of drama around that, they have a bank account which has a very large amount of real US dollars on. And supposedly, for each of these US dollars on that bank account, they have created one USDT, so one tether. And so, which means that, you know, if, you know, I have, let's say, a thousand tether and I want to, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to have these tethers anymore and I don't want to sell them on the blockchain for another asset, I can go to this company and tell them, look, give me 1,000 real dollars and send them to my bank account. And so these are collateralized um, stable coins. And there are, um, other, there are, so there are stable coins that are collateralized with fiat currencies like tether with US dollar. And there are fiat currencies that are, um, collateralized with cryptocurrencies. So for example, um, DAI, DAI is another stable coin, it's DAI, sorry, DAI, and that is collateralized with Ether, but it's over collateralized. So for each, I think one um, DAI, which is supposedly worth $1, I, I believe they, they have two, um, $2 in ETH or even more. So they have, let's say they have, or maybe let's say they have $10 million in ETH and they issued $1 million um, die tokens. And so you're pretty sure if you hold that you'll always be able to get back your money if, if you, if need be, because that is actually key in these stable coins. And, it, and that is trust, right? People need to be able to trust that what they hold is also actually worth what it represents. It, what they hold is also, also always worth $1. Um, and so a final type of stable coins is called algorithmic stable coins. So algorithmic stable coins have either no collateralization or a very small amount of collateralization. And these are built on algorithms. algorithms. Um, and so there are different ways that these work. But essentially, Luna and UST were both parts of a algorithmic stable coin mechanism where UST was a coin that was worth always $1. And the, the price of Luna fluctuated de de um, depending on the demand for UST. And so, you know, if whether there was more demand of UST, the, the price demand of, of Luna would go up and down. And it's a fairly complex mechanism and it's probably too deep to go into here. But essentially it was based on trust and it all everything went really well when the price of Luna was going up. Um, but the problem with these algorithmic stable coins, and we've seen a few examples in the past, none of them as big as this one, is that once things go bad and people start losing trust, things go bad really, really quickly. And so to give an idea, I mean, I said it, right? If you were holding 100... So I saw a screenshot of a dude who showed me his wallet. It was on Twitter, who said, I've lost everything. And so he had 11,000 Luna, which at the top was worth around, a bill, uh, around $1 million, right? 100 Luna each. And so when he showed that screenshot, his wallet was worth $250. Imagine one week thinking you have a million dollars and then the next week, suddenly that being worth $250. So there's a significant amount of people who lost a significant amount of money just because you know the trust went away and the value of these tokens completely imploded. But why, why, why did the value go away? What happened? So the problem was that um, the, and, and, and this, it's hard to explain this very well without going too deep into the mechanism, but the problem was that the UST, which was supposed to be worth $1, started losing its peg because of sell pressure. So someone, and so people think that this was done on purpose, and actually I also think it was done on purpose by someone who was selling a lot of this USDT, and because of market forces, because there's a lot of people selling um, the, the peg, so basically the price was actually um, lower than $1. And the moment people start seeing that, they start to think, okay, well, maybe, you know, this isn't as safe because everyone knows that this, there's a risk here, right? And then more people actually start selling and um, there's actually more downward pressure on the peg. And then suddenly the, the value of Luna starts going lower because another mechanism that people can redeem Luna for, for this, this USDT and, and then keep selling. And so essentially you know, the peg goes down, the value of Luna goes down, and suddenly it, it goes faster and faster and faster. Um, and you see Luna go from, you know, $100 all the way down to zero. And currently USDT, which, uh, sorry, UST, which was supposed to be $1, is worth 10 cents. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of people have lost money. And then one quick point I would like to make here, it, the question is like, why would people want UST, right? W w why do you want it? And so this brings me into a point I'd like to like have your opinions on. Essentially, what they said was the people behind this Terraform Labs, they, they were the company behind Terra, the blockchain, Luna, and UST, uh, which were the, the tokens. They, they created a protocol where you could stake UST 
and receive 20% yield. So if I had $1,000, or maybe let's say $100 for simple math, if I have 100 UST, I put them, I stake them into this protocol called Anchor, and at the end of the year, or over the year, I would receive 20 UST out of nowhere. That sounds too good so to it's be like, true. Oh, thank you. That That's exactly what I was expecting from you, Maria. <laughs> and you've been listening to me say, if it's too good to be true, it probably isn't yeah. true, right? And so this is... This was a problem or one of the problems, right? So they incentivize people to, you know, buy into their ecosystem and by promising these amazing yields. And a lot of people did that with the promise of at some point, UST will be widely used. And at that point, we don't need to promise this 20, 20% yield. And there's going to be a lot of need because you're going to be able to pay with UST within shops and within different games and within different other protocols. Um, but before they got there, the whole thing imploded. And I feel that this made me think a bit of some of the other Ponzi-nomics we see within games where there is this, you know, self-fulfilling feedback loop of people, you know, making money, getting their friends in. Um, but then those friends, actually, that money is used to pay them back. And so it's like, you know, gathering people onto your platform in the hope that at some point, instead of then having utility, you know, these assets will actually lead to some fun, right? Come on, come play our game through Ponzinomics, get, get, get all of your friends to join. This is going to be fun, I promise. Uh, so that's what made me, you know, it reminded me a bit of that. I forgot how enthusiastic Nico is when he's talking about <laughs> crypto stuff. <laughs> it's so awesome. <laughs> It's fascinating, yeah, you know? It's, it is. It's, it's, it's it just, is. just me. I've been actually doing some research on my own, and I've been reading uh, the recent Blockchain Weekly by Navik. And, uh, highly recommend. Yeah, highly recommend it. And uh, so that I know a bit better what you're talking about uh, beforehand. And, well, it actually seems kind of uh, simple. I mean, uh, with your explanation and with what I read uh, in the newsletter, so I got the idea of what happened. And I also have a friend uh, who didn't have like a million dollar worth of Luna, but he still had some. And he was very much sad about the whole situation. We discussed that last week and he did lose money as well. Yeah. Yeah. I guess what's, what's interesting to me is just like Luna was the, I don't know, like the sixth or seventh largest cryptocurrency by market cap. UST was the third largest stable coin. Um, in the market. And so these things falling apart, um, it does send, you know, ripple effects through the industry. Um, and, you know, it's hard to, to say what, like, what exactly did this cause elsewhere? What was already going to happen anyways? You know, it's a big, big market. But, um, you know, part of, you know, UST trying to stabilize, even though it failed, was, you know, selling a lot of Bitcoin, which put pressure, um, you know, on the Bitcoin market, and when Bitcoin gets pressured, everything <laughs> in crypto tends to tends to, to follow suit and correlate. And so, um, yeah, it's just fascinating how one project falling apart can then can impact a larger market as a whole. Um, but also, I mean, I think there are lessons here in tokenomics and Ponzi-nomics and um, even hubris to some extent. If you just kind of look at how the how the team behind um, all the you know, everything Terra and Luna just, you know, they thought they had everything figured out, even though they didn't mm -hmm. really at all. Um, and just a reminder that this still is pretty experimental technology. And so, yeah, it sucks to see people, you know, lose everything. But hopefully it's also a reminder to not put everything <laughs> into into some of these projects just because, you know, you never know what's what's going to happen. But yeah, really sucks to see. But, you know, the industry will carry on. Mm -hmm. well, what are the effects on games? So this is a geek question, right? Because there were actually games being built on top of Terra, on top of that blockchain. Um, so one maybe quick tangent here before we go into the like repercussions, like what, what companies can learn from this. Um, they're intending to make a new Luna chain. Um, where they will take a snapshot at some points. Um, and so they're, it's basically like the last thing, the, the only thing left for them to do, right? Because the current iteration of Luna was completely destroyed. Um, and, and I'll go into a bit more, well, if, if we if we have the time. So basically the supply of Luna went from 300 million to like 6.5 trillion or something insane like that. It basically grew like a million percent over two weeks, um, which means that the total economics of the chain are, are done for, right? It, it just doesn't make sense anymore. People were able to buy, like you could, with $1, you could buy like 10,000 Luna, which used to be worth uh, like a million dollars. Anyway, um, so 
um, what was I going to say? Yeah, about yeah the, the the consequences of building on a chain. So basically, what's what's to learn here? I think if you're building a, um, a blockchain game and you're you have to choose a ecosystem to build in, um, you know, there's this concept called Lindy that means like the longer something has existed, the longer it's likely going to still exist in mm -hmm. the future. And I think this speaks for um, ETH as a you know ecosystem and as a blockchain as the most stable um and so you know every time you choose something else in ethereum you, like there should be a good reason to right um because there is always more risk um obviously the like transactions fees could be could be lower uh, this is a similar story to what we saw with ronin right there are new things being built and every time something new exists there's always risks involved um one other interesting part of this is that Terra was not EVM compatible. Um, EVM compatible means that it uses the same bytecode and maybe the, may basically the same infrastructure as other um, or as Ethereum. So if Terra had been EVM compatible, it would mean that all of the on-chain stuff that was built on Terra could very easily be ported to other EVM compatible chains. The problem is it was not EVM compatible. And so that is another risk to take into account when you're choosing a blockchain to build on that if it's evm compatible it is safer and there's more tools for you to use um and so yeah these are some of the, the learnings from for for specific game developers that had chosen to build or maybe are looking for another chain to I build yeah, my guess is, oh yeah yeah I, I was about to echo that yeah oh, my go. guess is like i don't i don't know why anyone would continue to stick with terra at this point even if they <laughs> rebuild mm -hmm. like it's yeah. it's like a yes yeah, it's a loss of trust, and um, it really is an advertisement for Ethereum, as you were saying. Like the Lindy effect is very real, and um, you know, even though crypto is still nascent, I think it's like starting to become more of a, a, you know, more of a relevant factor people should consider. And yeah, I think Maria, you you mentioned Polygon, um, and so you start to see like others who are building, you know, mainly on Ethereum, kind of swoop in to try to take help these games and teams transition. And I bet they're going to mm -hmm. have a decent hit rate too. Cause um, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, if I were, I were building, I would absolutely be looking to make a switch um, just to, you know, to, you know, it's a distraction as much as anything, right? Like you don't want to really think about overthink about what you're building on. You just want to build. And so going over to what mm -hmm. you know is much more reliable. Um, should be the an easy decision at this point yeah so I, i'm going to arrive here with my truck and sideline the conversation a little bit um i'm not i'm not Do crypto it. skeptic i'm not crypto hyped i'm in between i think there's good and bad things uh, and i think what web3 will look like in a few years will be different to to what it is now um so don't take this question as me being anti from a gaming perspective we talk about the benefits of blockchain is giving players ownership. And then if they want to leave, they can leave the ecosystem and get some return on their investment. And then there's almost a second benefit, which is the play to earn. And you can make money by engaging with, with the game, with your time. Doesn't this show the risk of having tokenomics in a game? And are tokenomics actually necessary for a blockchain game? Is it... Is it not worth just doing NFTs and then if players leave, they can sell their NFTs and buy and have a, almost a trading ecosystem? Like, why do we need tokenomics? I think some of the dangers are present in this example. What, is, what do you mean with tokenomics? Well, having tokens in your game. You mean a fungible token? Yes. Okay. Um, so my answer would be is... Um, I think that, so the blockchain for me in its, its essence is nothing more than a database that is shared across the world, that is distributed, permissionless, that anyone can see. Um, and so, you know, instead of having my game assets live within the database of a game and a publisher, my game assets actually live on a decentralized database. So if that game publisher goes bankrupt, I can still see my assets, you know, in that decentralized database. And so for me, um, what this allows is it turns every game economy into an open game mm -hmm. economy where I can transfer value from the real world into, you know, that game because my game asset, I can sell it with like real dollars with some, certain steps in between. And so for me, 
whether we use fungible or non-fungible tokens, so whether there are tokens involved or NFTs, um, doesn't really change. It's, it's for me, it's the same thing. I, I think you can achieve a lot of what you want when it comes to you know have, giving people ownership through only NFTs, but the same can be said for tokens. Um, and so for me, these, these are similar things. And I don't think they could be achieved without the blockchain, like, you know, having this this public database where the assets are stored and where that keeps track of who owns what. I think that stuff is something that we, well, I think that's what the blockchain does. That's what the blockchain is. And, and it serves its purpose. And because this is a nascent technology, we're, we're going to see mistakes. And, you know, there's just going to be value destruction, value lost. Um, but for me, this is not necessarily a sign that that you know, this technology is, is not worth using within games. Yeah, I think the technology is inherently neutral and it's just how people use it that makes it good and bad. And we're seeing a lot of bad mm -hmm. implementations um, and a lot, of, a lot of risk emerge because of the bad implementations. But it doesn't mean that there aren't good implementations. But I do think that, you know, kind of as companies are learning what works and doesn't work, that the way that games start approaching tokenomics is going to change. Like the obvious example is like Ponzi nomics. Like there should be like red flags around any any game that thinks that's a good idea. If you play with fire long enough, you are going to get burned. Um, but I do think too, like um, some games, sure, like they might not need fungible tokens. They can just lean more on NFTs and some kind of economy. Um, some other games and something that we're starting to actually recommend a little bit more. Um, to, to certain clients at Novik is that um, they might not need the dual um, token system and instead the in-game economy not be like a crypto token and so that they can control it and mm -hmm. control more of the, the risk of booms and busts in the economy, but still have some type of governance token that provides you know, real ownership and you know, impact in some way. And so I... And, you know, some games shouldn't even do that. And, you know, they could have multiple tokens or it could be one token that spans multiple games that are really similar within the same ecosystem. Like, I think we're just going to see so many different implementations. But I don't think the takeaway from this is that it's inherently bad. It's just that there are a lot of really bad implementations and it still is very much a learning journey. So be careful. Yeah, it didn't. With Sorry. Sorry, Sorry I just wanted to clarify my position here. I'm not saying it's a bad thing and have a blanket. I'm actually just getting a bit tired of so many people taking this opportunity of what happened to post on social media. You know, oh, this is why Web3 games are yeah. not good and they shouldn't exist and so on. I think there's good and bad in everything. Um, can, can I make a preemptive comment about that? So because blockchain technology allows for a permissionless and pseudonymous transaction of value over the internet, I'm going to predict right now that we're going to see enormous like thefts of specific, like of game economies, like within, like, I think games are going to get hacked in some way. Um, and a norm, like lots of like a super large amount of value is going to be extracted either from treasuries of games or with, from the game economy itself. Um, and so like that is going to happen. And uh, like, this is part of this, you know, this learning process, like we're still in the wild west here. Um, and so, you know, if you're building with this technology, be mindful that this might happen, um, especially the more experimental you are. If you work with partners that have done this before and um, that are established, that your risks are lower, um, but the risks are always Yeah, there. my question, my thoughts were more that in free-to-play games, you usually have, you know, three core pillars, soft currency, hard currency, and then the assets you own by your progression. And what I've been seeing in the in Web3 gaming is that it seems companies are going all in and making all those three pillars into blockchain. And my question is, does it have to be? Is it more risk conscious to maybe make one of those aspects, you know, the assets into blockchain and the other two are not blockchain related or have your hard currency be a token or something? Yeah, that, that was quite helpful. Sorry, Anton, I interrupted uh, you, you were going to say. Yeah, I was just, uh, I was just, going to clarify like your question if i understood it correct that uh why would you need exactly to implement tokenomics inside the economy of the game when you could just have like a web 2 game with nfts right like the play to own more of a play to own uh scheme against the play to earn 
Um, and what I was going to ask is that what would be the best technology, the blockchain tech to build your, with Terra out of the picture, obviously, what would be the best blockchain now to do that with all that compatibility and all of that stuff? And I also wanted to, because, uh, you know, I've been uh, buying some crypto lately. <laughs> what, what, what with the crypto winter coming in? Um, and so I just wanted to, uh, to to clarify what would be the best blockchain and to maybe buy some <laughs> token. <laughs> I don't think we can give financial advice on the episode. No, I'm just but... kidding. I'm just kidding. But, uh, you know, the, the, the blockchain question still remains. I'd love to to have Anto, uh, sorry uh, Aaron's take on this as well. For me, um, I'll, I'll give two. So I think, in, especially in the short term, I think um, as a builder, I would have a good look at Polygon. Um, they're doing great things. They recently partnered with Meta. Um, I think specifically Instagram is now doing NFTs with them. So that's the, I think they're doing great stuff, and and they're also like like they're thinking long term ahead. Um, and then the, the the other one that is slightly more experimental and a bit more long term is a company called Stockware. They're based in Israel and they're using this new technology called zk rollups, zero knowledge rollups. That is like if if they explain like how that works, you're like how the hell can that can that actually work? Like it doesn't make any sense. Um, and so it's it's very this very complex maths. Um, it is still pretty early stage, but they're actually sorry, it's, and they're the company behind Immutable and So Rare. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're like. Um, building very very scalable like infrastructure to build blockchain games upon one of the disadvantages of, of Starkware for example um, and the public blockchain that they're launching is that it is not EVM compatible so it's a new coding language so it's not solidity um, and so that's something to take into account but um, th these are two of the blockchains that we're we're uh, recommending depending on what stage a uh, certain company is in but would love to, to hear what, what Aaron suggests as well yeah I like those answers um Polygon and Immutable are both really impressive in what they're doing, and they leverage Ethereum. So you know you're still getting backed by you know the the most proven you know non Bitcoin um, blockchain of them all. Um, I, I guess I would just add I'm also curious about uh, and might throw Solana into the conversation. I think it has a lot less um, like tokenomics risk compared to a like what Luna and Terra have gone through recently. Um, but there obviously are trade-offs, like you're taking on more centralization for much higher throughput and things like that. Uh, whereas you don't necessarily mm -hmm. need to make those trade-offs if you go on Polygon. Um, but I think for you know some teams getting started, it still is worth like having having that conversation around what building on Solana could look like. And I know that team too has also been like pretty supportive. There's, you know, funding <laughs> that you might be able to get around there, kind of similar to other ecosystems to kind of help accelerate your your project. So I would that's the other one that I would consider, but that's not like a strong, like a super strong endorsement. I haven't I haven't built anything on Solana yeah. myself, so I don't really because know. Because Solana but. Solana uses Rust, I believe, which is also a programming language that all yes. people have to learn compared to is this solidity yeah yes on, on ethereum I, if i'm if i'm not mistaken rust is what you use for unreal is that is that correct i recognize the that... name and i was trying to remember what project i worked on <laughs> where i heard it i should know this yeah the so. theory was that um ex like that, that rust is a language that a lot of people know which is why it, it makes it easier to start working with um oh, for, with for solana web two developers yeah okay mm. yes Yes, okay. but it's not a, again also not EVM compatible. Right. Okay. Um, um, which again like means that like if Solana goes bust, which, which I, I don't expect to be fair, um, but there is a risk for that. Then um, it's it's again harder to make the transition to another. Um, so I've, I've, to, yeah. to back sorry, to because of the time, we need to go on to the yes. to the next roundtable topic. I'm really sorry. We could do a full episode on this. There I was know. a really good article shared in the Navic newsletter, uh, Navic Digest, that I will put in the show notes. It has this whole really cool spreadsheet with the pros and cons of the different solutions out there. It was very informative. Um, so, Aaron, do you bring good news? Uh, no, I do not. Let's talk about oh, no. even more bad news. Um, <laughs> such a fun episode. Um, so I um, know. Yeah. So let's talk about the the bear market that's going on. Um, we can. Uh, we could talk about crypto maybe a little bit, but I think we could probably emphasize, you know, just other things going on in the gaming ecosystem here too, and just talk about what it means for 
consumers, companies, funds, and we can get into to M&A too with Anton's next topic. Um, and I'll, I'll try setting the scene with some macro context first, but of course, everywhere in the world is a little bit different. I'll offer my more US-oriented perspective, which should generally correlate with elsewhere in the West, but you know, it might not be perfect. But um, anyway, to understand right now, we have to first look back a couple of years when COVID occurred, not only did the video game industry experience a demand pull forward, uh, but government money printing and handouts, you know, increased consumer demand across the board because people just had more money to spend. And a lot of that money also went into the market, both public and private, which helped push valuations up to, you know, what are especially in hindsight or unsustainable highs. So now we're seeing a lot of that demand in the economy start to dissipate now that government handouts are reduced and inflation is enforcing people to buy less with the same amount of money. And in many cases, consumers are also taking on more debt to maintain um, their standard of living. If you look at like credit card data and things like that, and that, that's also not going to be sustainable. And this contributes to a pretty major pricing reset across the board, especially in assets with more risk, but also, you know, across the games industry. And in the US, we've we've already seen our first quarter of negative GDP growth. And it feels increasingly likely that the next one will be two, which means that we're probably in a recession right now. And a recession that begins with an asset pricing reset and tightening consumer demand will cause ripple effects. And so the question here is just, what those are, and specifically what it means for the games industry, which in the past has proven to be a bit more recession proof, but obviously tighter spending paired with general COVID whiplash. I mean, we are we see you know companies like Roblox, um, you know, et cetera, like just face tougher like comps, um, you know, year over year over the past couple of years. Um, it just means that perhaps someone won't upgrade their Nintendo Switch or might not buy their second seventy dollar game this month or splurge on a second subscription or buy an NFT or whatever it is. And who knows how much um, demand will fall. It's too early and hard to predict that. But the interesting um, questions here are if demand slows paired with a press and reset, what does it mean for all of the players? And I think the best place to start um, this conversation is just what does it mean for the day-to-day -day operations of normal games companies and their employees? Um, if we see markets fall, and um, just consumers spend a bit less. And so I, I guess I would just kind of open it up. And we all here have different perspectives on this. Um, and so I'm just curious what you see, what have you experienced, or what do you expect to, to kind of happen um, kind of within company day-to-day -day operations? And then we can kind of hit more on like the investor perspective and things like that afterwards. So first, Aaron, I'm, I'm sorry, but I have no idea what happens inside companies now. I've <laughs> actually never really worked for a public company, so it's hard for me to say. Um, what I am saying, um, what, what I can give some of my perspective on is on the um, what we recommend to founders of startup companies right now. And, um, you know, we are mindful. So I've been through a bunch of bear markets in the crypto space. and. If this comes together, so we expect there to be l less or lower valuations for fundraisers over the coming, um, you know, 18, 24 months. And so what we um, recommend founders right now is to be careful um, or mindful when hiring, um, mindful of cash burn and um, yeah, make sure to, 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 you know, try and, and focus on survival for the moment because raising money um, over the next, you know, two years might be slightly more difficult than, than last year. Mm -hmm. So from a day-to-day -day perspective, you can already notice some impacts of inflation. I believe in the UK, inflation is now at 9%. Uh, costs of energy bills are skyrocketing. So I had to renew my contract for my energy bills and it's about 1, 1, 1. 1.5 more a year, which is a lot. Um, you leave the studio to go buy food around here. Everything's expensive. Even the food markets are increasing the price. So even the day-to-day -day of just working and living your life is more expensive nowadays. Um, you go to the pub, it's more expensive. So I think there's a lot of pressure right now on companies to increase salaries more because usually you know, you'd increase the salary at a 2% inflation rate 
uh, maybe a small bonus on top of that. And now you have the industry in general asking maybe a 10% bonus. You're trying to match inflation. And that's a lot to ask for a company, especially after COVID, where, um, and also after in the mobile, in the mobile industry, post IDFA, where UA costs are still higher. It's just a lot of added on costs in terms of the development um, and live operations of games. And it's already really hard to recruit and have great people join your company and everyone's trying to grow to do more things. It's getting very expensive to run the business. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know, now with all of this investment also flowing in, I don't know if we'll see more people maybe joining Web3 Gaming, I'm not sure. Or other companies are getting massive rounds of investment because those companies have the cash flow to pay these higher salaries that people want to maintain their lifestyle. Because right now, because of inflation, if you try to maintain your lifestyle, you're just going to have to pay more um, and you'll save less. So, yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll um, go ahead, Anton. Yeah. Um, so first uh, thing is that I feel like I... I should be sorry for for you know for the for the prices rising up because uh, at least um you know the what, what with the energy bills and all of that it seems like um it, it's like our fault <laughs> for some reason <laughs> yeah but um no, uh, at least uh, that's what you know they tell us here anyway um yeah on on one hand uh games as an industry um has always been recession proof and it has uh, proved that during the 2000 during the year, the year of 2008 uh crisis and uh games seems uh seem to be the last thing that people usually ditch when they uh have some economic problems and um Bless you, Nico. And um, that's uh, what you know. That's what uh, keeps me some kind of optimistic about the whole situation because uh, usually people um, drop some other stuff first when prices go up, and they can maybe drop you know fitness or some outside activities. But it usually takes a lot less um, financial energy from you to you know just. Uh, sit inside on your couch and maybe play some mobile game or some PlayStation game or whatever. On the other hand, it's absolutely true about what you've just said about the, you know, raising uh, salaries and, you know, paying out bonuses and all of that because people usually uh, get used to this kind of uh, life very fast. And I just had like last week, I had a conversation with my, with one of my um team members who was asking about a pay raise, a half year pay raise, right? But things have not been very good recently. So we had to like settle on maybe some more waiting time for that. And I believe that happens already and will happen more uh, for at least the end of the year and maybe some time in 2023 for a lot of gaming studios. Yeah, I think that's all good perspective. Um, yeah, gaming traditionally has been a bit more recession proof. Like entertainment has been a bit more recession proof and like alcohol and, you know, <laughs> you know, things things like that. But people, you know, stay in instead of going out. Um, but um, I don't think it's necessarily going to be completely recession proof. And I do think we will see a lot of companies just become tighter with spending or they'll slow their decisions around spending. And so like you guys were saying, um, probably we'll see slower hiring. In some cases, maybe even layoffs. We're starting to see that in tech. Um um, even from like fairly strong companies, but kind of pairing like recession risk with like idea, like still like dealing with post IDFA deprecation concerns and things like that. Like some companies are um, in harder positions than others, um, especially if they're struggling to maintain their own revenue growth, much less, you know, to try to manage expenses. Um, but, you know, it could also mean that just companies are have to be more methodical and like their R&D budgets. And so it might not be willing to take as big of risk on like new emerging industries as quickly as they were in the past instead kind of focusing on what is more of a sure thing. Um, and it also just means that like it does affect employees and as you as you all were saying, like affects like raises and things like that. It also affects like 
um, when when people own equity in the companies that they they um, they join, um, that can have a really big impact, especially um, in public markets. When we've seen companies like Unity and Roblox go down eighty percent, like that that hurts. That's that's really hard to deal with. But um, it also affects just like the enterprise spending that goes on. Like companies are probably going to be slower to add more software tools or add more research or just add more you know, trips and spending and things like that, which also have ripple effects elsewhere um, and the economies. And my guess is that, you know, certain parts of the industry, like especially the more like uh, emerging areas like VR, where people would have to splurge to buy like a new headset that's separate from what they already do gaming wise or, you know, even blockchain gaming to some degree, just people kind of taking a step back to reset and you know, think about like what, <laughs> like maybe I shouldn't have spent a thousand dollars on that NFT uh, that doesn't do anything yet because the game's not live. Or, um, you know, just kind of thinking more about like how hard you, like how much you spend in some of these projects. Um, I think some of that, those emerging areas could be more affected than, you know, just say your typical Call of Duty um, or Candy Crush or things like that. So, um, yeah, it'll be really interesting to see how it unfolds. Hopefully, uh, it's a shorter hit and not a, a longer recessionary hit. Um, um, but you know, it's good for teams to be having these conversations more early than later, so that you can prepare um, uh, and you know think about just being wise with with your money. Um, but Nico, I'm I'm kind of curious to kind of twist this a little bit. Um, how how do you think a you know this bear market will or already is affecting the venture market? Like, has it affected what you see go across your desk? Like, what deals are popping up? And like, just generally, like, how are teams thinking differently about valuations now? I just kind of like would like to hear like your more grounded take on what's really going on there. Hmm. Obviously, it's still early days and, and people don't suddenly like stop fundraising or change valuations by like cut them in half. Um, and so we'll have to see how this play out over the next uh, weeks and months. One interesting thing that happened is that a few funds got absolutely obliter obliterated by what happened with, with Luna. Um, I know of funds that lost multiple billions. Um, yes, so it's 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 been like pretty significant, and so obviously they've mm -hmm. stopped like they were in the deal process, and they've stopped that. Um, so yeah, that that's that's one thing that happened that is is quite significant. Um, what we expect, or what I expect moving forward, is that um, we'll probably see valuations for blockchain gaming companies come back down to earth, right? Um, I mean, it was like with sometimes we, we saw experienced team raising a seed round. Uh, of like 10 to 15 million dollars at like a hundred million dollar valuation, which is absolutely insane, um, you know, pre-products. And so um, these things we, we won't see uh, over the next months and years. Um, we also expect the overall quality to be slightly better to increase. So the, the average quality, I would say, because it feels and it felt over the last months a lot like a lot of people suddenly saw like oh you know this this is a big opportunity right and we, like we're taking our failed you know web 2 game or we're slapping nfts on it and and maybe add a fungible token and this is definitely going to work um and so we saw a lot of deal flow uh, we saw a lot of you know companies pass by of which very high amounts was like pretty low quality um and so we think that you know over a bear market we're um yeah we're pretty like the people that actually want to use this technology not so much as a either like a new way to, to make easy money um or you know as a as a as a like a D gamify DeFi kind of thing uh, will probably go down so um i think you know as as a fund we're we're pretty optimistic and and hopeful i think throughout crypto the moment that prices go down of of, of these these public assets these tokens that's when the cool things get built, right? All of the successful mm -hmm. games today were, like for example, Axie was actually building in 2018 when the whole market went down. And that's when they, you know, created the, their core community that really believed in them. Um, and so, you know, what we're gonna see now is, like this is when people build, sit down, don't bother about hype, like bother less around, you know, keeping up the, the prices of their tokens and they're gonna come out the other side with like an amazing product um, and, and game. And so, um, yeah, that's what we're excited for. I, I agree. And from 
companies are feeling a little bit of a pinch. It makes you have to optimize, work better with who you ha- who you have with the reduced hiring. So you'll become more efficient in your development processes because you're working within those restraints. So I think at you know apart from the very unfortunate cases where a company does get um, wiped out and has to let go people, I think it might make the market just generally stronger. As an employee, I was actually thinking about this regarding M and A. Then we can segue into Invest Games report because we're we're running very close to the ending time. As an employee, I will be looking at game companies who will be letting go of people because what that te- in this M and A world, a lot of games co- game companies now have a parent company, and if I see a game company letting people go during a difficult time. That will make me wonder the relationship that that company has with its parent company of how harsh are the forecasts um, targets that they need to hit. Um, yeah. Yeah. We'll, absolutely. We'll, we'll see. And first, uh, people will have to get creative. I mean, on the production side, on the business side, because as uh, you guys have put it absolutely uh, correct, uh, the valuations blown out of proportions have like relaxed lots and lots of people on the market. And now uh, what happens is the beginning of uh, some kind of purge because lots of projects that have uh, gotten money just because uh, other people had those money, uh, had that money on their hands, they will be uh, most probably let go from the market and only the most, um, you know, only the projects that are most, um, uh, that have, as Nico has put it, uh, the most loyal audience and uh, the most uh, viable product will stay there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, often the weak break, but the strong get stronger. And sometimes these cycles um, can, can be healthy from that perspective. And in some ways, like this isn't even like the market going down as much as it is like normalizing <laughs> from from what was just too high to begin with over the past couple of years. But let's go ahead and segue. Um, Anton, I guess you can, I, I kind of want to talk more about like what the bear market could mean for M&A and just like, like that part too. But maybe it would be a good segue for you to first like introduce um, the report and things like that. And we can True. get more into how much How much time do we have left? If we could summarize the big beats in five <laughs> minutes, Anton, and then five minutes to Skype. We're already right, going a little right. bit over time. I'll do my best. So uh, as uh, some of you might already know, we released quarterly reports and um, half a year report and uh, annual reports on the gaming deals. And so we did that again for the first quarter of 2022. And the biggest thing that we have found out is that the total value of all the deals uh, in the gaming industry of both closed deals for the period in question and uh, for the for those announced, uh, achieved the number, the amazing number of $100 uh, billion, which already, uh, you might have heard about that, uh, which already beat the whole value of the, of the year of 2021. Um, and so I believe that's the direct... Um, uh, the the direct uh, thing that that's that, that's followed the all the overblown valuations and all the free money we had on the market uh, in the previous years, and this will probably be the last year uh, that sees th- that amount of money on the market and uh, these amazing growth that we've been monitoring for the last like two or three four years. And uh, to answer Aaron's question, uh, we still expect uh, M&As to grow, uh, but we already see some kind of correction because uh, in the first quarter of 2022, M&A deals reached pretty much the same results uh, year over year. So as in the first quarter of 2021, um, and the deal value saw a notable decrease. So we saw less deals uh, than a year earlier. Uh, and to, to, to uh, be exact, um, the first quarter of 2021 um, had the Zenimax acquisition. 
right? So it was $7.5 billion. But again, um, uh, the first quarter of 2022 saw five deals, which contributed 68% of the total deal value. And I'm not, not going to list them. Uh, you may find it in the report, but uh, I believe that the second half of 2022 will see a bit less m a deals, both in terms of the deal value and in terms of the deal count, because this is the correction. And we've been expecting that for quite some time because, um, because of all the reasons we have already uh, discussed earlier. Um, I, the, the other thing I would like to point, since we don't have much time, is that blockchain powered gaming uh, again, showed very impressive year-over-year -year growth metrics. So obviously, uh, lots and lots of venture capital now goes into blockchain gaming. And the most amazing thing to me personally is that 50% of all the private investment uh, deal value deployed in this quarter uh, have been in this or that way associated with the blockchain-powered gaming. So $1.6 billion dollars of uh, private money um, has been put into blockchain uh, gaming services and products and games and studios. Uh, yeah, but uh, on the other hand, um, if we compare the first quarter of 2022 and the last quarter of the previous year, the growth is not that big actually. So I believe this correlates with what we've discussed uh, in the beginning of the episode with a correction on the blockchain market as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seems like Q1 definitely probably is the peak <laughs> for quite some time. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's hard to see how everything that's going on in the industry isn't going to have pretty profound ripple effects on these numbers going forward, I would guess. So like, I mean, for starters, we talked about valuations being lower. So like if all of that M&A <laughs> were to happen like this quarter or maybe next quarter, like it probably would be, or just uh, the deal value in general, like it probably would be at like a 20% like lower, just like total sum, if not, if not more, right? Just from market changes in general. Um, but, you know, changing times also have an impact on how deals get done and whether they should be done. And so, you know, for example, many companies might want to hold on to more cash from before. So they'll just be more conservative in making big, like spending M&A decisions. And I guess the caveat is that I would actually guess that many companies with the strongest balance sheets, which is generally big tech, like this is probably more the time for them to start going on the attack and start making some bigger moves at lower prices than they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So it could be interesting to see what like big tech and even like big entertainment to some degree, like even someone like Disney could swoop in and make a bigger, like a pretty big deal that many might not be thinking about. So that, that would be the caveat. But in a lot of other cases, I, I kind of would expect, um, you know, a pretty big slowdown. And if you look at like serial acquires, like still front, an embracer, um, you know, <laughs> they're good. They already are slowing, but they're going to have to slow down a lot more just because they use their stock as currency for so many deals. And now they can't do that the same. And if interest rates start rising to tackle um, rising inflation, then <laughs> it'll be harder for more companies to take on debt uh, or just be more expensive to take on debt or the same levels of debt to to make the the same types of deals as before. So, yeah, I and I would guess that, you know, when, um, you know, what whatever happens in public markets has to trickle into private markets because ultimately that's what determines exit events and how things get valued in larger companies. And so, yeah, there could just be a slowdown in how, you know, companies go public or even think about getting acquired in some cases just because they might not want to sell at, you know, at a lower valuation than their like last private rounds and things like that. So I think there's just going to be a lot, you know, newer dynamics for companies to think through across all of this. And I just don't see how it doesn't lead to a pretty major slowdown in like the frequency of acquisitions. We still might see some big ones, as I was saying, from like the big companies with tons of cash. But yeah, I have a feeling the next couple quarters are going to look very, very different, I would guess. Just to give you uh, some perspective on the public markets, so we uh, in, uh, in, the, in the report, we saw just uh, seven deals, seven public deals uh, of half a billion total value 
in the first quarter. So just for the sake of comparison, uh, in the sec in the first quarter of 2021, there were 38 public deals of uh, 8.7 billion dollars. So you can imagine the the amount of decrease. So. Well, I think we need to wrap up the episode, unfortunately. Um, but I, I think I'll just go through a note. This has been a quite a sad episode. So I'm going to bring the happiness back up by listing the good things in life. Um, workouts. If you are being laid off, what did you I say? I said workouts. Nico? Sorry. Workouts. Yeah, yeah. Watch Nico do CrossFit. Yeah. You can tune in in his new podcast segment. Um, yeah, if you're being laid off, there are a lot of companies out there. The gaming market is very hot in terms of recruitment. So I'm sure put yourself out there. You'll find your next your next role. I think we'll see companies showing a lot of love to their employees and being there for them. I'm very grateful to work for, for working at Hutch. And I think a lot of people would be grateful in seeing their companies really step up during these difficult times. Um, Nico, you said that the outcome of the bear market in crypto means that we'll see higher quality, mm -hmm. more creative projects coming out there. So we have that to look forward to. Um, so there's a bright end at the at the, at the end mm -hmm. of the tunnel. Hundred percent. And yes. yeah, we're, we're we're talking we're we're breaking it down, but ending it on a note of positivity because everything that is negative will eventually come up. And again. I'm really sorry if you're going through the loss with Luna. Um, yeah, reach out, take care of your mental health. Yes. And join the Navic Discord and we can continue the discussion <laughs> yes. there. Give you a virtual hug. And if you're looking for a yeah. job in games, um, you can also contact me. We have a bunch of companies that are looking for talent like you. Same here. All right, well, thanks everyone for joining and we'll see you next week.